With the latest agriculture news from across the state and nation, it's time for the AgNet News Hour from AgNet West. Here's your host, Sabrina Halbertson. Good morning, and thank you for tuning in this morning on the AgNet News Hour. Coming up later, we hear about different approaches to food security. We'll have more on that, but we start today with a preview of today's interview segment. In today's agricultural landscape, small-scale farmers are navigating a complex web of challenges, from supply chain disruptions to evolving food system needs. In today's show, we hear from Patrick Westhoff, director of the Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute at the University of Missouri, and Hannah Quigley, policy specialist with the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Here's a preview. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's a, a series of issues that are facing American agriculture today. Hannah's done a good job of laying out a number of the more important ones that affect uh, smaller scale producers. There's also, as we indicated, a, a, lot, a lot of questions facing larger scale producers as well, all of which put pressure to try to uh, make some changes, if you will. A major problem in trying to make some of those changes is a budgetary one. You know, part of the reason the Farm Bill debate hasn't made more progress so far is a lack of agreement about you know, how much money should be spent where. Uh, a general assumption has been that the overall bill should neither increase nor decrease the deficit. If that continues to be the working assumption, that means every time you want to provide more benefits to, to one particular group, it has to come at the expense of another, which, of course, is a very difficult thing to, you know, to try to get agreement upon. So I, I think those budgetary matters have been one of the major reasons why we have not seen more progress so far on the debate. Uh, well, I do think it's encouraging that some of the principals here are talking to each other right now. There's just so many obstacles that still need to be overcome that I, mean, I fear that there's a good chance this farm bill debate may may go on for some time yet. Yeah, I think I think um, in addition to that, I think that was spot on, <laughs> Pat. But um, in addition, you know, agriculture is shifting. The needs of our our farmers are shifting. The needs of protecting the soil and and um, reinvesting essentially right in the soil and in our communities, all of these things have changed over time. And so there's also a little bit more that we need to do as far as how we envision the future of, of food and agriculture um, in, in prioritizing those farmers that are, that are doing that work, that are not only investing, you know, in high quality soil health, but also high quality health of their communities that are that are really focused on providing and meeting the needs of their communities and the regions around them, um, while not necessarily practicing extractive kind of um, extractive practices, both on the land and or, you know, in their communities. So um, I think that's one thing in particular that it's just becoming harder to navigate because of that natural kind of shift in, in the larger systems thinking of how we move forward. Be sure to tune into the full interview later on in this show. In other news, the USDA's Forest Service is expanding a program to protect communities from wildfires. Gary Crawford has more. Forest and fire officials were hoping that with the arrival of fall, that wildfire activity might slow down a little bit, give firefighters a bit of a break. But we continue to have significant weather events and new fire starts. And not just in the West, but in other regions. That's Randy Moore. He is chief of the USDA's Forest Service. He told reporters that years ago, the so-called wildfire season who would last only three to five months. Today, though, wildfires are a problem pretty much all year long, especially in the West. And so far this year, we've had over 35,000 fires across all jurisdictions burning over 6.8 million acres. Now, that's slightly below the 10-year average for fires, but it's above the 10-year average for acres burned. So in other words, we've had less fires, but more acres burned. Back in 2022, the Forest Service launched a wildfire crisis strategy, a plan to focus wildfire mitigation efforts on 21 areas that were deemed most at risk from wildfires. And this came with unprecedented funding and support from bipartisan infrastructure legislation, as well as the Inflation Reduction Act. And to date, the Forest Service has strategically invested in 21 priority landscapes in the western U.S., and we've treated over 1.6 million acres in areas identified as most at risk. But Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack told reporters that the scope of the work now is being expanded beyond the original 21 high-risk areas. Today we're announcing a commitment of $100 million that will fund 21 projects in uh, 18 national forests across 14 states. Now, these resources are going to allow us to work with states, local governments, tribes, and 
uh, nonprofit organizations working to promote healthier force uh, throughout this 14-state area. Vilsack said these new projects will do more than just improve the health of the forests. We're protecting $700 billion in housing and infrastructure in the communities that find themselves uh, interfacing with uh, the force in these uh, very critical watershed and firesheds. Vilsack says these new projects will help protect 550 communities plus 2,500 miles of high-voltage power lines and 1,800 watersheds, which produce drinking water for millions of people. Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. You're listening to the Agonet News Hour. In today's National Spotlight, the Environmental Protection Agency has been murky at best in outlining how farmers, builders, and landowners should comply with the current Waters of the U.S. regulations. Chet Smith has more on the confusion surrounding implementation. Despite several requests for clarification by agriculture and other industries, the Environmental Protection Agency has failed to provide clear guidance on the 2023 revision of the Waters of the U.S. rule. Courtney Briggs, Senior Director of Government Affairs for the American Farm Bureau Federation, testified before Congress last week saying the agency has made the rule difficult to comply with. The agencies have not clearly defined very important terms within their rulemaking. These are terms such as relatively permanent or continuous surface connection. And I mention them because they are really linchpins for how this administration is seeking to implement the WOTUS rule. But to add insult to injury, the agencies have also failed to release implementation guidance to inform landowners as to how they intend to implement this rule. Chad Smith, Washington. USDA's chief economist recently explained some of the factors going into the department's September farm income forecast. Rod Bain reports. A net farm income forecast reflecting an over 4% year-over-year decrease per USDA this month. What's behind the forecast, though? Chief economist Seth Meyer recently conducted a more detailed look at the AgriPulse Ag Outlook Forum in Kansas City. Crop producers are expected to receive 10% less income for their commodities in 2024. Part of the reason that we're seeing softening commodity prices is because we have seen some improvement in some of the commodities in terms of global carryout, a period of a little bit greater global carryout outside of China. There is also increasing downward pressure on some commodities already experiencing low prices. The U.S. corn crop, as an example, is set to be the nation's second biggest on record this year. What are we going to do with that crop? Well, we got to have a combination of a robust livestock market domestically, got to send some to the ethanol plant, and we'd like to be able to export it. Which leads to questions of where corn exports will be going and how competitive exports will be. There is the blue Brazilian corn. That is a demand that China did not have in the past. China has now begun to accept Brazilian corn in the last year, year and a half, and that has really changed the competitive position for U.S. agriculture by way of exporting corn to China. A similar story applies to soybeans, a record crop expected, which in prior years, some could be applied as crush for domestic biofuel production. Yet, there is competition from a feedstock perspective. Large amounts of imports, both canola oil from Canada, which was already coming in to some extent before, and large amounts of growth of used cooking oil from overseas. For the livestock and poultry sectors, however, net farm income is forecasted to increase over 7% from 2023. That is fueled by rising prices for eggs, cattle, milk, and broilers. The chief economist, though, notes that supply constraints are preventing even larger growth in income at a time when livestock commodity prices are strong. Very strong cattle prices. But we're in a contraction phase of the cattle market. For eggs, this is a highly inelastic market in the short run. Only 5% fewer birds leads to a huge increase in prices. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. That's today's National Spotlight. Now here's the Livestock Report. What's in store for the poultry industry in the coming year? Gary Crawford has this report. The Agriculture Department is out this week with its newly revised forecasts for production and prices for the poultry industry, both for broilers and turkeys. Now, in most years, the outlook stories for those two products are very similar, but not this time. 
broilers and turkey, kind of um, opposite situations there. With a promising outlook for broiler producers, troubling times for the turkey folks. This from USDA Outlook Board Chairman Mark Jekinowski. He says despite the possibility of somewhat lower broiler prices in the coming months, the outlook for the nation's broiler producers looks pretty good. He says the broiler industry next year is set to boost output by more than half a billion pounds. And partly as a result of that increase, broiler prices may fall by a tiny one-third of one cent per pound next year, down to $1.28 a pound. But still overall, fairly favorable market outlook for broilers and uh, looking at good margins into 2025, especially with the lower feed costs which are in some cases running 20 to 30 percent lower than last year. So that's the good side, the good news side of things, the broiler side. But for the nation's turkey producers, it's not the greatest of times right now. Production continues to decline and prices are declining as well. Mark Jekinowski says turkey producers have been trying to keep production down and support prices, get them up at least stable in the face of declining consumer demand for turkey. USDA has lowered its forecasts for this year's turkey production down to about 5 billion pounds. Lowest U.S. production since 1995, but even despite that, uh, margins are still weak and uh, we're not looking at much improvement into 2025 either. But maybe some improvement. Let's look at the uh, turkey price situation. USDA is projecting for this year an average price of 93.7 cents per pound. We lowered that again this month. And then for next year, we're forecasting an improvement, just given how low prices currently are. Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We will be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. You're listening to the AgNet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Here's a preview of what you'll be hearing today with the AgNet West headlines. International Fresh Produce Association brought together volunteer leaders serving on the U.S. Government Relations Council and Political Advisory Committee in Washington, D.C. this month to dive into a policy retreat to help chart the course for 2025 advocacy priorities. The meeting, which took place at the National Harbor, had a shipping theme, and that set the tone and expectations that industry priorities are set by industry voices. The program included a joint session between the two volunteer groups, which featured several experts and topics for discussion. The sessions featured a look at the upcoming IFPA strategic plan, as well as research on the headwinds and currents that may impact the industry. The volunteer groups transitioned into their own standalone meetings in the afternoon. The political advisory committee focused on the fresh pack and grassroots efforts, while the U.S. Government Relations Council spent much of their afternoon engaging around the industry policy priorities for the remainder of 2024 and into 2025. Providing incentive-based programs and tools to assist growers and landowners with working lands conservation is essential in adaptation efforts, according to an agriculture department official. Rod Bain has more. Voluntary, incentive-based conservation efforts, such as USDA programs and collaborations such as the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities, are essential in producer buy-in for working lands conservation. As farm production and conservation undersecretary Robert Boddy recently told an audience at the AgriPulse Ag Outlook Forum in Kansas City, Regulatory approaches to working lands conservation has limitations. Regulation typically does a pretty good job of stopping bad things from happening, but the fundamental question we're confronting when it comes to climate smart agriculture is how do we encourage producers to adopt new technologies, new innovations? How do we de-risk those things? Regulation isn't very good at that. Good at stopping bad things, not particularly good at getting people to adopt new practices. He adds conservation programs based on financial and technical incentives also serves to keep producers producers on working lands to provide needed conservation services. I'm Rod Bain reporting, Washington, D.C. In Farm and Ranch headlines, there are a few available clues in USDA's Cattle on Feed report. As to the direction the beef industry is headed, here's USDA livestock analyst Shale Shagam with key numbers. Now, the number of cattle on feed on September 1st was just under 11.2 million head, which was about 1% above a year ago. During August, just under 2 million head were placed on feed, which was about 1% below 2023. Um, feedlots marketed about 1.8 million head of cattle during August, which was about 4% below a year ago. But one has to adjust uh, that number for the fact that there was one fewer slaughter day. 
in 2024. So when you make that adjustment, we're actually about uh, eight tenths of a percent above 2023. The California Avocado Society is preparing for its annual meeting. Registration is now underway. The meeting will be Friday, October 25th. Registration for members is $80. Non-members can register for $110. Registration does go up in cost after October 18th. The meeting this year will be held in Palo, California, which is near Temecula. Sessions include a hands-on approach to farming and information on the latest rootstock trials, as well as pest and disease management. You can get more information online at CaliforniaAvocadoSociety.org. In other news, the USDA has launched the Distressed Borrowers Assistance Network, an initiative designed to provide support to financially distressed farmers and ranchers across the nation. Farm Service Agency Administrator Zach Ducheneau says the Distressed Borrowers Assistance Network underscores their dedication to farmers and ranchers receiving the tailored support they need. It's Climate Week in New York City, and while perhaps not as famous as New York's Fashion Week, it is bringing agriculture into the spotlight. Speaking at a forum co-hosted by Food Tank and the James Beard Foundation, CEO of Organic Valley, Jeff Frank, discussed the benefits of organic farming. In the scheme of things, organic farming is pretty good already, but we want to help them get even better. And so we've uh, pioneered our carbon insetting program, which really is helping to fund projects on farms like solar installations or um, improved manure management practices, things like that, to help them get even better. And and through all those practices, we, we do see a meaningful benefit to not only the environment around the farm, but also um, with the soil health overall. Organic Valley is a dairy cooperative consisting of 1,600 family farms around the nation. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. There are many different contexts and approaches when describing food security. Rod Bain looks at some of those descriptors as food security in part one of a series in this edition of Agriculture USA. Food security. It is a term heard in several contexts, all associated, though, with the premise to make sure an individual, a country, our globe has enough food for sustenance and growth. While some, like USDA research economist Matthew Rabbit, look at food security from the lens of statistical data on how many households in our nation are food secure. The annual food security report provides valuable and timely insights into the types of U.S. households that are having difficulty meeting their food needs each year. Others might approach it from the perspective of farm biosecurity or inputs and practices. The Haberbosch guys won a Nobel Prize for figuring out how to make synthetic nitrogen and Many people say that the world would have starved if we hadn't figured that equation out. I'm Rod Babe. Craig Rudo of Growmark is among those joining us as we fill in the blank at the beginning of the statement, blank as food security, in this edition of Agriculture USA. Blank as food security. It is a statement perhaps with a different beginning each time, depending on how an individual or a nation or even our collective world approaches it. And those approaches are diverse. Many will answer having enough food for everyone, everywhere to eat as food security. Matthew Rabbit of USDA's Economic Research Service is among those annually collecting and analyzing data on the measure of food security in our country releasing the annual household food security in the U.S. report. There's a lot of very interesting findings that are coming out of this year's report. Food insecurity among U.S. households increased to 13.5% in 2023. What about the various methods, technologies, innovations, and inputs needed to grow the food we all need daily to survive? So, for instance, Corey Rosenbush of the Fertilizer Institute makes the case of fertilizer as food security. We have some scientific studies that show that 50% of the crop yields on a global basis are attributed to fertilizer use. So all around the world, we need to ensure that growers have access. And a lot of places in the world, they don't have access to fertilizer like we do here in the U.S. Or Crop Life America's Kelly Bray may point to crop protection products like pesticides as food security. We talk a lot about food waste and food loss in our culture. It's critical to think about the loss that happens in the field as a 
result of weeds or insect pressures so that we have tools at our disposal to be able to use safely, efficiently, and when and where needed is a really critical part to make sure that those weeds and bugs don't get that food before America's consumers do. Sustainability is an approach many farmers and ranchers have applied for decades regarding production of food, long before that word became both popular and marketable. Former USDA Farm Service Agency Administrator Val Docini, now with Syngenta, sees sustainable ag practices as food security. Sustainability really is essential to substantial food security and the ability of companies to provide the tools to American farmers to ensure the kinds of yields that they'll need to feed not only the folks here in the United States, but the world, as we've done since the end of World War II when it comes right down to it. Regarding the protection of the structures, infrastructures, crops and animals within a farm or ranch complex. Emily Ellis of the Animal Agriculture Alliance described biosecurity as food security. Biosecurity and farm security go very much hand in hand. When we talk about farm security, we're specifically talking about keeping out unwanted visitors, unexpected visitors, which plays into biosecurity, which is keeping the animals healthy, making sure that you're not bringing in unwanted diseases or anything like that. Biosecurity as food security is also represented in scientific study and innovation against various crop and disease threats. For instance, the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility in Kansas. This is Megan Needenwarder of the Swine Health Information Center. It will allow those diagnostic assays for foreign animal diseases to be done right at the facility. It's also going to be a facility that allows disease research investigation of ASF, CSF, foot and mouth disease virus, so that we can be learning more about not only control and prevention, but thinking about new vaccines or or mitigation tools to inactivate viruses and feed. While the examples just discussed provide an idea of the diverse, complex, yet necessary components of food security, this is just merely scratching the surface. More ways to fill in the blank in blank as food security is coming up in a future program. This has been Agriculture USA. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Farmers in the southeast are bracing for another tropical storm. Gary Crawford has more. Producers in the southeast are paying more close attention to weather forecasts this week, trying to get an early answer to this question. What happens with what will soon become tropical storm or hurricane Helene? USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says Helene is likely to be a full-fledged hurricane by the time it comes ashore somewhere along the eastern Gulf Coast. The crop most likely to suffer wind and rain damage, of course, would be cotton, whose bowls are open. And Rippey told us... Georgia, a significant cotton production state, has 68% of the bowls open on September 22nd. And again, we will carefully watch that in the days ahead as this tropical system barrels toward the southeastern U.S. In Washington, this is Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. This segment is brought to you by Live Earth Products. To get to know a little more about Live Earth Products, we're talking on the phone today with Vice President Russell Taylor. What about humates and animal feed? When can you add humates to the animal feed and what is the benefit of that? So the interesting thing about animal feeds is just like the fertilizer side, there's actually a lot going on in legislative processes. So there's an act out called the Innovative Feed Act. And currently, you can't include things in animal feed that are giving you other benefits besides nutritive benefits. Let's say, for example, you had a cow that was eating a product that reduced its methane emissions, those enteric gases that are caused just in the natural digestion of a ruminating cow. You can't claim that those products do that benefit. So hopefully uh, people will get involved and say, look, the Innovative Feed Act is necessary and should help farmers. Other benefits of feeding humate is obviously first to reduce enteric gases. But the second one, these are old plant materials. So the, those plant materials are rich in trace minerals. So not only are you getting something that's going to help the digestion of the animal, you're also getting an abundant supply of minerals. So that is the main reason farmers are currently including in their animal feeds. This is all fascinating, but it can be hard to retain some of this information when you're hearing this um, on the radio or through the podcast. So is there some place online or where can our listeners go and get more information? Well, the good news is the acts I mentioned, like the Innovative Feed Act, 
and the Plant Biostimulant Act are publicly available through Congress. You can actually go look at those acts that are on the website there. The other information you can get is directly through Live Earth products. So if you go to liveearth.com, contact us. You can contact us and our agronomy team. And we're happy to go over any details, questions about how to use these products, how they fit your farm program, how to use them as a tool to implement conservation practices such as nutrient retention, water conservation, and improving soil health. To get to know more about Live Earth products, you can visit them online at liveearth.com. That is spelled L-I-V-E-A-R-T-H dot com. You are listening to the AgNet News Hour. In today's agricultural landscape, small-scale farmers are navigating a complex web of challenges, from supply chain disruptions to evolving food system needs. In today's show, we hear from Patrick Westhoff, director of the Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute at the University of Missouri, and Hannah Quigley, policy specialist with the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Together, they shed light on the importance of the Local Food Purchasing Assistance Program, or LFPA, with nearly 600 organizations signing a letter urging Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack to extend funding for LFPA. The conversation highlights the urgency of federal support for small and underserved farmers and the pressing need to ensure that their voices are heard at the highest levels of policymaking. Here is today's interview. My name is Pat Westhoff. I'm the director of the Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute, better known as FAPRI, at the University of Missouri. And I am Hannah Quigley. I'm a policy specialist with the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. I wanted to talk about several groups that uh, sent a letter to recently to Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack. So if you would, tell me a little bit about the letter and why this is important. Yeah. um, So let's see, the Local Food Purchase Assistance Program, um, it was essentially authorized and, and initiated by USDA in 2022. Um, Agreements were being signed kind of by state um, and on a rolling basis as they were, you know, able to to send in their applications, develop plans with USDA, et cetera. Um, and the, the program was intended to be temporary. Um, it was, you know, initiated to respond to kind of a crisis in local supply chains and to meet the increased need of food insecurity among families. Um, but the program, which has a very clear farmer focus and and supporting small and underserved farmers has been extremely impactful. I think to some degree, honestly, more than maybe folks expected or anticipated. Um, and so we've seen over time, and you know, since the program started, that there have been many localized supply chains being set up, new networks, you know, new food system networks, food pantries working with food hubs for the first time, connecting with more small scale community Um, food pantry operations that are not traditionally served through some of the existing food access and emergency feeding channels. Um, And and farmers are scaling because of it. So we've we've seen a lot of farmers that are that are leasing more land, those that are incorporating and investing in cold storage infrastructure on their farms, those that are partnering with other farmers and developing aggregation and distribution systems. Um, it's so it's it's you know having a bit more of an economic impact and really a focus on those kind of economies in in a variety of settings and a variety of scales for communities. Um, we've seen interest in sustaining this program congressionally from from congressional members on the Senate Agricultural Committee, and as you know probably uh, we we're having delays you know in farm bill negotiations, which we were hoping to have the program authorized and codified in in a in farm bill, but so since that is not immediately present um, or immediately an option, we are looking to Secretary Vilsack who would have the authority to continue funding for the program, at least, you know, in the short term while we await that authorization. So the the letter was really to demonstrate to the secretary and USDA that we need their help essentially so that farmers are not kind of falling into a gap in funding just based on um, the inability right now for uh, a farm bill to come to fruition. Great. Um, thank you for that, Hannah. So, Pat, why don't you go ahead and expand on that, on what Hannah had to say and give your thoughts on this as well, why uh, this letter is important and what you're hoping Agriculture Secretary will be, uh, be able to do. Sure. Well, we won't be doing any advocacy because that's not what we do here at FAPRI, but I uh, may say a few words about the Farm Bill discussions right now. We are seeing some serious uh, talk among 
the principals, you know, the chair and the ranking members of the House and Senate committees. So I think there is at least uh, some intention to try to come to an agreement, but whether they're going to be able to do that between now and the end of the year is very much up, open to question. Uh, even if those principals were to come to agreement, they have to be a good time on the floor, have to get a willingness of leadership to be able to bring a bill up. So unfortunately, there's a good chance that it may be 2025 before a farm bill actually gets approved. And, you know, I have asked a lot of people this question. I'm going to ask it to you as well, Pat. Uh, what does that mean to your organization and organizations like yours if we have to wait again uh, for the Farm Bill to be passed? Yeah, in, in our case, we do get some funding that's uh, uh, tied to the Farm Bill, if you will. But but most of that can be taken care of and is taken care of in appropriations bill. So it's not immediate concern for us in that respect. We do a lot of analysis with and for Congress looking at policy options. So, uh, you know, the fact that the farm bill debate continues means we still have lots of work to do to try to be able to provide the information that those policymakers need. And we've seen an extension and, you know, and and which is not unusual. In many years, we have seen the extension of the farm bill um, as far as recent farm bills go. Uh, what would it mean to have just another extension rather than the actual, you know, 2024 farm bill that we have all been waiting on? And uh, Hannah, I'll let you go ahead and start. So sorry, Sabrina, I lost a little bit of connection. Could you repeat that? Sure. Um, you know, I, we have seen extensions before with the farm bill. What would it mean, you know, for our listeners who maybe are not as versed in this, what's the difference between having another extension of the farm bill, of the 2018 farm, farm bill, versus finally having um, the new farm bill? Right. Yeah. Um so, I mean, the conditions of really, honestly, our, our food system and the needs of farmers were very different in 2018. Um, a lot has changed um, for farmers in our community since then. And so a continuation of a 2018 farm bill is just kind of maintaining that status quo. So um, there are there are not updates to essential programs that we've kind of been looking to update. Um, there are also some potential like op opportunities to essentially lose funding um, if, if, if not otherwise incorporated into the Farm Bill baseline. You're listening to the AgNet News Hour. We continue now with Patrick Westhoff, the Director of the Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute at University of Missouri, and Hannah Quigley, Policy Specialist with the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. And then when we started out, I said that there were several organizations who signed on this letter to the agriculture secretary. And to clarify what several means, it's nearly 600. So that's many organizations that signed on to this organization or to this letter to the agriculture secretary. Do you hope that, and I'll ask this to both of you and whoever wishes to respond first, but do you, do you feel like you're being heard in this and, and, you know, are, are the voices of all of these organizations being heard about the, the needs that you guys are currently facing? I might just say that, you know, there, there, as you indicated, a broad swath of, of people are interested in trying to see some changes made in the farm bill. It can only happen if a new farm bill passes, uh, you know, basically commodity organizations, for example, are unhappy with the level of support provided by the current suite of programs. The simple extension of the bill doesn't address that, you know, so they want to see some modifications of existing legislation to provide to increase the, the level of the safety net that is provided. So again, I think there's a, a people hearing it, but whether they can do something about it, unfortunately, is proving to be a, a different question. I would, I would say, you know, I think the the scale of farmer being heard, it, it is definitely different. Um, there's a much more attention um, being brought to some of the large scale commodity growers, you know, that there were a handful of them in DC just a couple of weeks ago. And honestly, they were, they were some of the voices that were helping put, apply pressure again on the farm bill. And I think renewing that, that pressure and that timeline um, to move along, but I don't think we're hearing quite the same level of attention from, you know, our smaller scale farmers who are highly diversified, maybe operating on less than 30 acres, less than five acres. Um, and so those voices, far more of them are likely being uh, kind of under amplified in messaging. And what does this mean to those small uh, farmers that you mentioned? You know, they face so many difficulties. You know, it's, it's just not easy to be a small farmer. And when you have legislation that should be helping you out and then that's threatening to no longer be valid, you know, what could this mean to all of our small farmers? You know, there are a number of provisions that our coalition has been advocating for that to reforms for crop insurance in particular for some of these small 
smaller scale, but also highly diversified farmers that have just had unreliable access or, or barriers to accessing whole farm revenue protection programs, a form of crop insurance for, for more their diversified scale of operations. Um, and you know we need a farm bill to address some of those in order to protect protect their operations to protect them and and not losing their farm if there are you know extreme losses due to flooding or kind of other extreme weather conditions so with a program like the uh, LFPA how important is that to our local small farmers as well yeah um in particular you know we've seen USDA's procurement and the way that USDA sources food for schools, for the emergency food assistance program, though that has been difficult <laughs> to, for smaller scale farmers to navigate just purely based on the way that they, they solicit contracts with farmers or food hubs, you know, distributors, they're, they're larger scale, they're often multi-states um, that you have to, you know, you have to be able to meet multi-states and, and large number or large scale scale of orders. Um, so the small scale farmer just doesn't have a lot of opportunity to be competitive in that market. And the local food purchase assistance program, the way it really is different is, you know, it's still federal dollars being spent on food, but it's brought the decision making down to the ground. It's brought it to the state level. Um, the state has partnered with a number of food banks or food hubs, their localized networks. And those are the people that have these relationships with this, the smaller scale farmer, the one that can go, you know, to the farmer they know has been trying to break into a wholesale institutional market and to be able to help them learn how to do that production planning, what food safety requirements they may need to upgrade, um, how to safely store their food in order to, you know, maintain appropriate temperatures until arrival at its, its final destination. Um, but these are the folks on the ground that are that are willing to take those extra steps that USDA's commodity procurement team cannot necessarily take. Thank you again to Pat Westhoff, Director of the Food and Agriculture Policy Research Institute at University of Missouri, and Hannah Quigley, Policy Specialist with the National Sustainable Agricultural Coalition. That's today's top agriculture news. I'm Sabrina Halverson. To get more information on the topics you heard today, visit Agnet West online at agnetwest.com. AgNet West Radio Network, your primary choice for agriculture news.